good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invite to participate in this uh, meeting virtually. I'm uh, Dr. Frank Tarazi from Harvard Medical School, and today I will be talking to you about the latest finding on immunotherapies for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, without going into too much details, we know that the two pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease in the brain are the accumulation of the uh, amyloid beta plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles. And as we see here from the slide, these are the amyloid beta peptides are usually released as monomers. Then they start aggregating together to form clumps of proteins, what we know as the amyloid plaques. These plaques actually as they become more and more aggregated and bigger in size, they will start impairing the synaptic dysfunction or causing or resulting in synaptic dysfunction, which eventually will result in neuroinflammation and neuronal death. The um, uh, other pathway, which we also know about the neurofibrillary tangles is the tau protein. The tau protein will start aggregating as the p-tau uh, phosphorylated tau forming the fibrils and tangles, and also these clumps of um, uh, pro-toxic proteins will eventually result in the same pathway, uh, which is synaptic dysfunction, followed by neuroinflammation and neuronal death. So the idea of the um, immunotherapies to develop specific monoclonal antibodies is to try to reduce this aggregation of amyloid beta, beta plaque, or to reduce the uh, aggregation of the tau tangles. And uh, you know, this is accomplished by developing, again, monoclonal antibodies that are specifically raised against these two toxic proteins. So in this regard, we have three different monoclonal antibodies that have attracted attention recently, and have one of them, as we will discuss, have shown enough benefit to be FDA approved. And there are two other uh, monoclonal antibodies that are in late stages of development. So we have the first one, aducinumab, uh, then uh, denonumab and gantorinumab. And as we see from these slides, basically, these are the clumps of toxic proteins, whether beta amyloids or tau tangles. And the monoclonal antibodies come and try to well bind to these toxic proteins and try to remove them from the brain and expel them out. And by doing so, we are, you know, we will avoid the cascade of events that eventually leads to the uh, neuroinflammation and neuronal death. So I'll start first by discussing the uh, results of aducinumab and the data uh, of this monoclonal antibody. This is an antibody that was developed, or at least right now is uh, under the auspices or uh, you know, management of Biogen, a, a company in uh, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And, uh, Looking at you know, what is aducinumab, it's a monoclonal antibody. And as we see, this is the antibody and um, has a shallow compact epitope that contributes to its selectivity for A-beta aggregates. So the idea of raising you know, um, um, monoclonal antibodies is to be very selective and specific to the target of interest. So we will minimize the binding of this uh, antibody to non-specific sites, which may trigger adverse events or side effects. And you know the uh, the antibody will interfere with the aggregation. Uh, you know that we have with the uh, the um, you know, fibrils and reduces the formation of the neurotoxic A beta oligomers. So the the trial that. They, they did, uh, um, Bajan did two trials that, uh, the first one was called the EMERGE trial and it included 1638 patients. Uh, they were randomized into three arms, the placebo arm that had uh, 548 patients. And then they tested two doses of aducinumab. The low dose was, you know, between three to six milligrams per kilogram. And the higher dose was six to 10 milligrams per kilogram. And, you know, as we will see the titration was needed to reduce the incidence of adverse events. And there, you know, they had a, the numbers were more or less randomized equally among the three arms. From the looking at the demographics of these patients, you know, they are, you know, again, the randomization is very much comparable across the three arms. They know starting with age, they're all around 70 years old. And, you know, looking at the 
APOE carriers and non-carriers, also the randomization was very equal in this regard. So we had equal number of carriers and equal number of non-carriers that were uh, you know, randomized equally across the three arms. More importantly, if we look at the uh, baseline disease characteristics and you know, specifically the, at this, the, the scales that we typically use to assess the behavioral symptoms of Alzheimer's, and as we see here, the CDRS3, which is the clinical dementia rating, some of boxes, the score was around 2.4 uh, to 2, uh, 7 to 2.5 for the three arms. A score of 2.4 or 2.5 on the CDRSB suggests that these patients are in a very early stage of the disease. They have you know, mild uh, Alzheimer's or even MCI that precedes Alzheimer's. The same for the ADAS-COG and ADCL, which measures functional activity as we see. And again, the MMSE, the many mental state examination, they all had a baseline score of 26.4, which suggests very early stage of the disease. This is the idea that this trial focused on enrolling patients in a very early stage of the disease, either MCI stage, the mild cognitive impairment, or in early uh, dementia or early Alzheimer's. So the, the, these patients were treated with uh, these two doses uh, on monthly basis for 78 weeks. You know? So trials with Alzheimer's disease tend to be much, much longer, say, than trials for uh, new drugs in depression or schizophrenia, for where a period of six to eight weeks will be sufficient to get an idea if the drug is working or not. Here, as we see after the trial took 78 weeks, and the end, at the end of 78 weeks, we see that patients, especially who received the highest dose of aducanumab and reached the 10 milligram per kilogram, the, that this high dose you know, resulted in a, a slowing the decline in cognitive functions by 22% as measured on the clinical dementia rating sum of boxes or the CDRSP. Um, if we look at the other scale, the next scale to look at, is the ADASCOG and um, similar to well, you know, with the, what we have seen in the CDR, those patients who were treated with the highest dose actually you know, had a 27 decline uh, in their uh, cognitive functions at the end of 78 weeks. Um, so th th this is ADASCOG 13. It's the Alzheimer's disease assessment scale that focuses on the cognitive subscale of 13 items. And you know, this is widely used in the assessment of cognitive uh, functions and uh, memory and executive functions in Alzheimer's patients. And it's typically one of the standard endpoints that are widely used in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. The third one was you know, the ADCS, which is the uh, Alzheimer's disease corporate study, the activities of daily living. And this specifically looks at you know, the, the daily functional activity of the patients, the degree of independence, the degree of the ability of the patient to engage in functional activity uh, and you know, shows that, say, how is this patient able to walk alone, dress alone, you know, eat alone. So this is a very important, you know, usually secondary in point to look at the in, in improvement in the functional activity of these patients. And here we saw the biggest effect that the highest dose of aducanumab resulted or slowed the functional decline by 40%. This is very impressive, you know, in terms of the ability of this treatment after 78 weeks to profoundly improve the functional decline that is typically CSA compared to placebo patients. We see an improvement of 40% on the, in their daily functional activity. So uh, the, these are the, the three scales that we looked at, the CDR, the ADAS-COG, and the ADCS are all measuring behavioral endpoints, uh, you know, reflect different uh, domains of cognition, uh, memory, executive function, daily functional activity. So what about you know, the biomarker uh, that is supposedly is the target of aducanumab? And in this regard, you know, we want to validate that aducanumab does engage with the target of interest. It does reduce the levels of the beta amyloid, the toxic protein in the brain. And eventually as a result of this reduction in uh, the protein, uh, if, you know, we do see this improvement in the different behavioral symptoms that uh, we just saw. So in this regard, you know, you're looking at this, if you look at the, at the left, 
this is the baseline showing the accumulation of beta amyloid at, uh, uh, you know, at baseline for those patients who were treated with different doses of aducanumab. Then on the right, you know, where I'm here, it's after one year of treatment with the antibody. As you can see here, if you compare, you know, the, the, the right to the left uh, uh, sections, there is a dose-dependent decrease in amyloid plaques. And at the highest dose of 10 milligrams, there is a profound reduction in levels of beta amyloid after one year of treatment or infusion of this uh, antibody. So this, uh, you know, the PET scan here does provide evidence that the target, that antibody is engaging with the target, is reducing the levels of this toxic protein in the brain, and this eventually may have translated into the improvement of the behavioral symptoms of the disease. You know, this is clearly shown now that um, both the low dose and the high dose did reduce the levels of amyloid, uh, you know, uh, uh, did reduce the levels of amyloid protein, toxic protein, as early as, you know, 26 weeks, you know, the, the, that we see here significant signals. And it was the both doses, the low and the high doses were effective in this regard. And, and 78 weeks, we see profound, again, reduction in beta amyloid. Uh, in uh, using both those as the low and the high dose. So the, here we have two things that this trial showed to us. It did show that uh, there are improvements on different behavioral endpoints, and it did show that there is significant reduction in uh, the biomarker that they are going, we are going after, which is beta amyloid. Interesting that, you know, we, when we looked at other biomarkers, it was not only beta amyloid that was reduced with this antibody, if we look at the second biomarker that is also involved in the pathophysiology of uh, Alzheimer's and speci specifically in the formation of the tangles, the tau, we see here that there is also reduction in tau levels in the CSF of these patients, the phosphorylated tau, and you know, as well as the total tau, especially the phosphorylated tau has reached significant levels in terms of reduction compared to placebo. And uh, you know, even at lower doses, we do see that you know, the, uh, the antibody was effective in clearing the levels of uh, tau in the brain. So um, uh, what we see here that you know, the antibody provided us with an evidence about engagement with biomarkers. It provided evidence about some improvement in the behavioral symptoms as we discussed on different behavioral endpoints. So what about the safety of uh, uh, these antibodies or aducanumab, uh, there is something of concern when we do trials with the monoclonal antibodies for Alzheimer's disease. It is called what we call ARIA. And ARIA is the amyloid related imaging abnormalities, which we look at different you know, potential adverse events that may happen in the brain as a result of the administration of these antibodies. So they can be, you know, um, the, the area, the edema, the hemorrhage, the uh, cerebral hemorrhage. So these are all side effects that, you know, may happen with these patients. And that's why, as we will see, that these patients will need to be monitored uh, closely throughout the course of treatment with this antibody. The, what stands out in the side effects that at the high dose, the 10 milligrams per kilogram, we saw a relatively high incidence of aria E or edema. 35% of these patients did have uh, aria E. And the second side effect was the aria H, the hemorrhage, 20% of these patients also experienced or had you know, potentially signals of aria H. If we look at, you know, in general, those were the two most common side adverse events, the aria E, 35% of the patients, followed by aria H, about 20%. But then that's nothing important to emphasize that the majority of these patients who experienced aria E did not experience symptoms during the aria E episode. So those were either very mild or asymptomatic, and they will only detect it through the uh, frequent and regular MRI scans that these patients had to go through throughout the course of the trial. And, and the other thing also that this area E episode generally resolved within four to 16 weeks with no long-term clinical adverse events. So, you know, yes, that these, this antibody in this trial did cause adverse events, but to a certain degree, they are well managed, especially if detected early through the close monitoring of these patients. 
So this is the first trial that Biogen did, the eMERGE trial. And from the name, we can say that this trial emerged successfully in meeting the endpoints, in engaging with the biomarkers, and in relatively having a more or less an acceptable uh, adverse or sa uh, safety profile. They went and did another trial, which is you know, a, simultaneously. So they were running two trials, one the eMERGE trial and the ENGAGE trial simultaneously at the same time. And uh, also in this trial, they had over 1,600 patients, 1,647, that they were also randomized across three different arms, the placebo, the low-dose aducanumab, and the high-dose, similar to what we have seen with the eMERGE trial. So you can say that the ENGAGE trial is a carbon copy, really, in terms of the uh, design, in terms of the enrollment of patients, in, in, in terms of the inclusion criteria, in terms of the doses of the antibody, as well as in terms of the duration of the uh, trial. But here, and as we see here, you know, again, emphasize that even at baseline, uh, all the, the, the scores of the behavioral uh, scales, the CDR, the ADAS card, all reflect as well as the MMSE all reflect early stage of the disease, either MCI or mild stage of Alzheimer's. And in this regard, even these scores are very comparable and you know, it could be relative to what we have seen with the eMERGE trial. So in this regard, again, the inclusion criteria for these patients were very similar. I, in, uh, now, we, we, uh, unfortunately, the outcome of this trial was completely opposite from what we have seen with the ENGAGE trial. And uh, so we, there we did see that the, the, the high dose of aducanumab was able to show some improvement in terms of slowing the decline of symptoms on CDR or an ADAS cog and you know, showing some improve or significant improvement on the daily functional activity. What we saw here is actually there was no improvement on any of the main scales that we use to look at improvement in the cognitive functions or improvement in the memory and executive functions. So here with CDR, you know, there was in fact, you know, 0.03, no, no difference, no significant difference, no improvement on the three main behavioral scales that looked at the different behavioral symptoms of Alzheimer's. And even with the ADCS, which showed profound improvement, there was actually not a single significant improvement compared to the 40% improvement in daily functional activity that we have seen in the eMERGE trial. Uh, so, you know, what we see that this trial actually, the outcome was very negative. It did fail on every endpoint that uh, was looked upon or used as to evaluate the efficacy of the drug on the behavioral level. Uh, you know, the three main scales as shown here have failed to achieve any statistical significance. And even the functional activity of these patients was not significantly better than patients who, uh, you know, received or, you know, the minor improvement of 18% uh, compared to the 40% that we have seen with the same dose and, you know, in the eMERGE trial. So this is about, you know, this is considered a failed trial, the ENGAGE trial. What about the engagement with the biomarker? That was interesting because we saw that actually the, the two doses in this trial did also result in improvement or in reduction of beta amyloid using amyloid PET. And the results were very much similar in this regard in the, uh, as what we have seen in the EMERGE trial. And as you see, there is as, as early as 26 weeks, there is significant reduction in beta amyloid. And uh, you know that these effects extended, even as we see here, more significant reduction at week 78. And similar to uh, the eMERGE trial, the effects of uh, aducanumab in, this, in the ENGAGE trial was not only limited to the reduction of beta amyloid, as we see here, there was also significant reduction in phosphorylated tau at both the high dose and the low dose in the ENGAGE trial. So the, you know, the similarities between the EMERGE and the ENGAGE trials really has to do more with the changes in the biomarker. Both trials resulted in significant reduction in the you know, biomarkers of interest, whether with a reduction in beta amyloid or you know, clearance of a tau but they differ in the behavioral outcomes of these trials. So the eMERGE trials did manage to achieve significance on number of behavioral endpoints. 
as we have seen on CDR, on AVIS COG, and on uh, ADCL, uh, whereas the ENGAGE trial failed to show any improvement on the behavioral symptoms uh, of the disease. So based on these trials, which as we see, you know, um, were a little bit contradicting to each other, at least when it comes to the behavioral symptoms, Biogen did submit the, uh, the application for, you know, FDA for approving the drug. And in June 7, the decision of the FDA came and they approved, you know, uh, of last year, June 7, last year, the FDA approved aducanumab and it is traded now under the name of Aduhel. And it became the first drug actually approved for Alzheimer's disease in 18 years. The last drug approved for Alzheimer's was Memantine or Namenda, or in some countries is traded under the name Ibixa. Uh, that was in 2003. And uh, so now after 18 years, we had the first drug approved for Alzheimer's, but aducanumab can distinguish itself from other drugs as it is now the first disease modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. The approval of the FDA was surprising perhaps for so many because not just because you know, the, the outcome which many people expected that the drug will not be approved, it is because of the regulatory pathway that the FDA adopted to, have to approve this drug. They use what we call the accelerated approval program. And this program usually the FDA uses only to speed up the, the approval of drugs that treat serious conditions and that fill an unmet medical need. So really the approval here that was based on the change in the biomarker. And in this case, it was the reduction of beta amyloid plaque in the brain, not on the improvement in the behavioral symptoms. The consistent signal that came out of the two trials, the eMERGE and the ENGAGE, as we have seen, were this consistent reduction in these biomarkers, whether it was the beta amyloid or tau, uh, in, in both trials. But we did not see, you know, more or less consistent signals in improvement of the behavioral symptoms of the disease. So this was questionable. So the FDA used what is typically used in say the approval of drugs in oncology, uh, you know, the, uh, the changes in the biomarker became their, like the primary endpoint that they based their decision on in approving the drug. But then they did, said the FDA did not stop that, said, though we have approved the drug at this stage and it can be administered to patients, we, uh, we have asked Biogen to conduct a phase four trial to confirm the anticipated clinical benefits of the drug. And if the trial does not verify that the drug has clinical benefit, the FDA has the right or can remove the drug from the market. So, you know, what we have here is just not a full complete approval that we typically see with other drugs. It says like, you know, say a partial approval, the drug is approved, but still uh, Biogen has to conduct an additional clinical trial to validate the therapeutic benefits of the drug at the different behavioral endpoints. And if such a task or an endpoint was not met from the uh, you know, ongoing trial, then the drug can be still be removed from the market. And right now, Biogen is conducting this phase four trial, which will take still a few years to conduct because as we have seen, trials in Alzheimer's disease is, is a long process, will take years to accomplish from uh, enrollment of patients all the way to analysis of data and the release of the results. So this is the, you know, no matter what, June 7 is still, I consider the turning point in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease because we finally had uh, the first disease modifying drug and we had, you know, the first drug approved in general for Alzheimer's in 18 years. And, you know, this is how the drug is now being given to patients. We said, you know, we had the FDA after they revised their, their initial approval and said that at this stage, we have to identify patients only with mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia. So this drug is not for every Alzheimer's patients. It's not, I think, useful for patients where the disease has progressed to moderate or severe stages. It's only we have to identify patients in a very early course of the disease in MCI or mild dementia. It's the drug is given as an IV infusion slowly over a course of one hour. And the recommended dose that we should target is 10 milligrams per kilogram. But this drug cannot, has to be titrated very slowly. And as we see here, the, the course of titration, you know, the infusion and the 
uh, this drug is given again once every four weeks. So the first, you know, eight weeks, they will get one milligrams and we slowly titrate out until we reach, you know, uh, the, the seventh infusion, which is after seven months, this is when the highest and the optimal dose of the drug will be given after seven weeks. The idea here with this uh, slow titration is to minimize as much as possible the incidence of ARIA and reduce the risk of ARIA-E and ARIA-H. It's not just that, and how do we know about that? The FDA also requested that these patients need to be monitored throughout the course of treatment by sequential MRIs. So there will be an MRI done prior to initiation of treatment to get a baseline for it. And then there is a second MRI, the seventh infusion, which is exactly the first before starting the first dose, uh, the highest dose, the 10 milligrams, and then a third MRI at the end of one year, uh, which is the sixth dose using the 10 milligrams. So, and I think, you know, if the patient is going to extend uh, treatment beyond one year, because that's the protocol that was adopted in the label, these patients still need to be monitored very closely throughout the course of treatment with this antibody. So we have the new drug. So what was the reception in the medical, uh, medical community about this new uh, monoclonal antibody? So, you know, the drug, yes, aducanumab was approved, but we have several issues that were raised. Let's not forget that during, you know, the approval of the drug, the FDA did have a advisory committee to evaluate the drug. It was a, a public committee uh, that uh, in the public domain that uh, basically discussed all the data. And at the end of that, before, you know, they, they, this advisory committee voted overwhelmingly to actually reject the drug, not approve it. And, you know, um, using also people question the use of the FDA of this accelerated approval program to approve a drug for Alzheimer's disease based on a change in a biomarker and not based on an improvement in behavioral symptoms. So the, because the behavioral data that were presented were not convincing, as we saw that, you know, we had two trials, one failed and one succeeded. And, uh, you know, it's not clear at this stage what is the efficacy of the drug in terms of improvement of the different behavioral endpoints. This was followed by that, you know, many academic medical centers in the US declined to offer aducanumab to their patients after carefully reviewing the data, not just the academic centers, the US uh, Veterans Health Administration, what we call the VA hospital systems also declined to offer uh, aducanumab to their patients. And when the company tried to get approval for the drug outside the US, the uh, the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, rejected the drug completely. And there was, you know, even an advisory committee in Japan uh, recommended to reject the drug as well. And the last straw that were, you know, adding fuel, uh, gas to the, to the fire in terms of uh, acceptance of the treatment was the decision of the CMS in the US, which is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. This is the federal agencies that cover uh, most of the uh, health benefits for senior citizens that they said, you know, that the cost of the drug will only be covered in, in, under what they call coverage with evidence development, meaning these patients need to be uh, actually enrolled in a clinical trial uh, before the treatment can be covered, uh, the cost of 28,000. You know, the, the number may not sound high, but if we factor in, we have over 5 million patients, Alzheimer's patients in the, in the US, and maybe, you know, the, uh, up to 1 million patients may be eligible for this kind of treatment. This can significantly increase the cost for uh, the treatment oil using this uh, therapy. So all these things have more or less uh, basically put a dent in the use of clinical use of aducanumab in clinical practice. And what we have seen that the use have been very limited compared to what we have discussed before, you know, about the being the first drug approved in 18 years, the first disease modifying therapy. But you know, at this stage, people really not questioning whether this uh, antibody is able to engage with the biomarker, is able to reduce, you know, the uh, toxic proteins. It's whether it is effective enough in improving the symptoms, the physical symptoms, the behavioral symptoms of the disease. <clears throat> this actually did not prevent other companies from uh, trying to 
continue along the same line and perhaps develop you know, other antibodies that could be even better than uh, aducanumab. And in this regard, Eli Lee has an interesting antibody right now in development that is called Dunanumab. And as we see here, the idea that they're coping with Dunanumab, they are able to wipe out and clear you know, Alzheimer's disease from the brain. Uh, it's the same, it's, you know, this denanumab, it's an immunoglobulin IgG1, you know, specific from the, uh, for the interminal uh, pyroglutamate amyloid beta epitope. Uh, and, you know, in phase one, they found that this antibody denanumab significantly reduced uh, the amyloid plaque, even with a single dose in participants with amyloid positive. Um, you know, uh, so they conducted what we call the trailblazer study. It's a, a phase two study. And uh, again, they are focusing similar to aducanumab on early stage uh, Alzheimer's patients. And uh, we have seen th this is the baseline characteristics. If we look at the CDR, you know, this is 3.4 relative to 2.6, which tells me that these patients have a little bit, you know, more progression of the disease compared to 2.6. Um, you know, and uh, these patients were, again, no matter what, still they are indicators of early symptomatic population, similar to previous studies, whether with donanumab uh, or whether with other antibodies uh, that were in development. And, you know, they made sure that the APOE4 carriers were consistent in both, you know, arms. They had, uh, in this regard, they had only two, not three. They only tested one dose of donanumab at this stage. The number of patients, as I see, we see here, is 272. It is definitely much less than what uh, Biogen had in the both Emerge and Engage trial, where totally there we had over 3,200 patients. But this is, was still an early phase two trial. You can say more or less it's a proof of concept and, and a smaller number of patients that were randomized either to placebo or to receive denanumab for, again, a period of 78 weeks. Uh, we're going to focus here more interesting again on the biomarker because it's now more and more showing that the bio changes in the biomarker appears to be an important and pivotal step that the you know the and the treatment has to show uh, if you know that this is going to follow in the same footsteps um, uh, of uh, aducanumab and be reviewed under the accelerated approval program. And what I saw with the data that came out of the Dinamab that the, this antibody was significantly effective in lowering amyloid plaque and plasma tau 217. And as you see here, there's a profound reduction and rapid production of beta amyloid plaques, you know, as early as six months, then the effects were extended all the way to 76 weeks. And you know, as the same with plasma tau, uh, phosphorylated tau, there is a, the reduction starts at even earlier at week 12 after three months of treatment. And at the end, there is a 23% you know, decrease from uh, a baseline with a total of nearly 30% difference between the placebo and the drug treated arm in terms of clearance of the uh, plasma phosphorylated tau. Then, you know, Lily did something interesting, which actually they uh, uh, lowered, you know, they, as we see here in this study, they stopped the treatment. So in this regard, actually, amyloid plaque significantly lowered the nanomap treatment at six months. And then they stopped the treatment, uh, you know, um, uh, at six months. And they looked what happens for the duration of the trial. And in this regard, there was no built up again of the, you know, amyloid plaques or with tau. So, you know, so this is something, maybe it's something novel in terms of the treatment that these patients do not need to be treated on monthly basis, basis throughout the course of treatment. They don't need to be treated for, uh, you know, months and years with the treatment. It's enough, you know, if the patient uh, can be treated, especially those patients who have lower accumulation of amyloid plaques at baseline, that it's enough to treat these patients for, with, uh, with the drug for only six months, as we see here, then we can stop the treatment. And you know, uh, the effects or the clearance will continue throughout and uh, you know, uh, after one year, even after stopping at six months. 
So that's something interesting. So the, the course of treatment with donanumab, if it you know, continues to be replicated on a bigger scale trial, uh, can be only for specific patients for, you know, again, that have uh, low accumulation of uh, amyloid plaques at baseline, only for six months, then you know, we can stop the treatment and we can still follow the, the behavioral improvement of symptoms through, you know, longer than that. Because we saw that the, the, the effects were sustained that up to one year after the termination of treatment at six months. And in doing so, we, can, we are definitely reducing the risks of ARIA and reducing the, the need to monitor these patients after the treatment has stopped and definitely will also result in reducing the costs of treatment. So uh, as we see here, then the effects were very clear that this antibody is profoundly and rapidly improves the clearance of uh, the uh, both biomarkers, both targets, uh, the, and effectively engage with these two targets with the you know, much rapid onset of action and with much profound clearance of beta amyloid and phosphorylated tau. <coughs> Excuse me. So what happens and then at the, the behavioral endpoints, and they used, you know, a different end behavioral endpoints. Um, you know, Eli Lilly has typically developed or devised this uh, scale that we call the IADRS, which is a combination of the uh, ADASCOC 13 and ADCS. And the, this was their primary endpoint. And they showed that the drug uh, resulted in 32% slowing in decline of their cognitive function. Uh, looking at other scales, they also range between 23 to 40% um, uh, uh, decline in the uh, improvement or slowing in the decline of cognitive function. But that's something, you know, though it did achieve 32% significance at uh, week 78, you know, it still, it did not correlate exactly with what we have seen with the profound improvement or clearance of both biomarkers. Uh, you know, the clearance can be, have reached close to 100% in many patients. The improvement of behavioral symptoms was only around 32% uh, on the different behavioral endpoints, especially the primary endpoint using the IADRS. So I think this brings up the issue about the correlations between the change in a biomarker and the improvement in the behavioral symptoms of the disease. It doesn't seem that this correlation is one-to-one. -one. You know, though we get significant and profound reduction and clearance of these toxic proteins, the improvement in the behavioral symptoms, uh, you know, uh, does not correlate directly. And many times what we see is a lower incidence of or percent of improvement compared to the much higher um, improvement in the uh, clearance of the biomarker. But this is still very promising in terms of the effectiveness of this antibody uh, in terms of clearance of the both biomarkers and in terms of the uh, you know, rapid onset of action. So you know, in terms of uh, the uh, safety and tolerability, again, ARIA-E was uh, an issue that 27% of the patients did have ARIA-E. Uh, and uh, which is similar to what we have seen with other agents like aducanumab. Uh, treatment discontinuation was, you know, some very low depending upon strict protocol criteria and only 8% had uh, infusion related uh, reactions. So overall, still the safety is acceptable in this regard, though I still think that these patients, even if they are on a donanumab, they will be required to be closely monitored by sequential MRIs. Now, you know, Lily is conducting a much bigger trial because we said that the, uh, you know, the Trailblazer trial had only 272 patients, which is a relatively small number of patients. It's okay for a proof of concept, but not okay for registration and getting FDA approval. And so they're having now a much bigger trial. They call it the, the Trailblazer 2. And they have increased the number of patients from 272. It's going to now enroll up to 1,500 patients. And they are going to use two, uh, you know, biomarkers that will be used as a part of the inclusion criteria. They want to make sure that all patients will have amyloid positive, as determined by PET scans, and they also have to be stratified for intermediate or high tau burden or high intermediate or high levels of tau. 
And uh, you know, the primary endpoint is going to be the IADRS similar to what they had used in the Trailblazer one. This is an ongoing trial, you know, um, we still will need a couple of years before it is uh, finished, but I think we may get earlier data about the clearance of the ability of this antibody to clear the levels of these two biomarkers before we get the final outcome of the results in terms of the improvement on the different behavioral scales. But it will be interesting to see whether the, the promising results that we have seen in phase two can be replicated in phase three, especially when using a, or enrolling a larger number of patients. The third antibody that is right now is, is attracting attention is called gantorinumab. It is developed by Roche. And Roche is hoping that this antibody will be able to reconnect the dead wires or the, you know, the sprouting and uh, connections between different neurons uh, throughout the brain. Um, it's similar to the two previous antibodies that we have seen that dentorinumab was also effective in reducing amyloid plaques in patients with prodormal to moderate uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. And so for example, if we look at patient number three, this is uh, these are you know scans for five different patients. Patients number three, this is the baseline that look at amyloid plaques, and by the end, you know, after one year and after two years, there is a profound reduction in beta amyloid um, after you know uh, long-term treatment with gantorinumab. The same applies on all five patients. So this drug antibody. Uh, similar to the previous two ones, also effective in engaging with the target of interest, is effective in clearing beta amyloid in patients with prodormal to moderate Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you know, and it did show some, you know, potential improvement in uh, the behavioral symptoms, though uh, the, the trials uh, were not, uh, you know, that promising. Th but at this stage, uh, Roche is conducting two big phase three clinical trials. They are called, you know, the graduate one and graduate two. And they, as we see here that, uh, you know, they, um, they have around 1000 patients in each trial, which is a significant number. And the difference between the two other trials that I want to highlight about uh, this antibody, gantorinumab, that the trial is going to go for 27 months, uh, which is way longer than the two trials by Lilly and by Biogen, aducanumab and donanumab. So this will give us an idea about the long-term treatment of uh, using these uh, you know, uh, monoclonal antibodies, what will be the long-term prognosis, what will be the long-term adverse uh, safety profile, tolerability, are we going to see new adverse events be after you know, the typical treatment of uh, 78 weeks. So you know, th this is one thing about the you know, potential outcomes that to see the long-term perhaps the benefits or uh, side effects or adverse events uh, after treatment. So the trial will go for actually uh, 27 months. And the second thing, you know, as we see here, there was, you know, a 80% reduction in the amyloid uh, after three years in open label extension. The second and unique thing about gantorinumab is that this drug is going to be given subcutaneous. It is the first antibody that will be uh, a given or administered in a subcutaneous uh, formulation relative to two other drugs, they both denunumab and aducanumab will require IV infusion. And this usually tends to happen in a, um, in, in a you know, a clinical facility. Um, you know, but that's something interesting to see whether the subcutaneous administration of the drug will provide an advantage in terms of more convenience as the drug can be administered at home by a caregiver. It reduces the burden of IV infusion and enables in general to reduce healthcare uh, burden. We are expecting the results pivotal data sometime during the next half of this year. So, you know, by the end of this year, 2022, we should know more about the behavioral uh, outcomes of the both the graduate one and the graduate two uh, clinical trial. It's, uh, you know, uh, those are the three main antibodies that have been in development. There are still other antibodies that, that are in, you know, falling and still um, in uh, behind those three in terms of the course of development. There is a, an antibody called lecanemab, what used to be ban uh, 2401 by Biogen, and solinizumab, which actually 
is an old antibody that was tried by Eli Lilly in the past and failed in uh, clinical trials, but now it has been revived and being tested at much higher doses than the initial doses that were tested in the earlier trials. So it's not just, you know, the we have focused in this presentation on the monoclonal antibodies against beta amyloid. We have actually a, a monoclonal antibodies directed specifically against tau. And three of them are still in uh, earlier stages of development. So, you know, that's another approach in the treatment, not just focusing on beta amyloid, but also developing monoclonal antibodies that will specifically target tau and try to reduce the expression of these tau tangles and eventually prevent the cascade of events that will result in neuroinflammation and neuronal death. So just, I wanna conclude here by saying that, you know, that the beta amyloid hypothesis remains the leading hypothesis. It's the oldest hypothesis that we have for Alzheimer's disease to explain the pathophysiology of the disease. Um, you know, and most of the drugs, aducanumab, uh, and the other ones that we discussed basically principally target the beta amyloid, though we have seen they also can have the ability to reduce tau, especially with the data that came out from aducanumab and donanumab trials. That aducanumab was you know, approved in 2020, the first new treatment for Alzheimer's in 18 years, and the first disease-modifying therapy. You know, but as we have discussed, the approval was you know, surrounded by controversy and uh, from uh, different angles and uh, did not actually receive the expected reception from being such a breakthrough in the treatment of Alzheimer's. Perhaps they, that they convinced there was not enough convincing evidence to support the behavioral be the benefits, the benefits of this drug improving the behavioral symptoms. Nonetheless, I think this is opening the door for other antibodies to come. And perhaps, you know, we know that uh, aducanumab may not be the best antibody, but hopefully again, it will pave the way for other antibodies to come, which can provide improved treatment or better even outcomes than, uh, uh, than aducanumab. And as we have seen, we have donanumab, gantorinumab, and several other antibodies, uh, whether targeting the beta amyloid or whether targeting the tau plaques are still in development. So. Overall, I think these are exciting times now ahead of us in terms of trying finally to develop disease-modifying therapy, which is greatly needed for the treatment of patients because ultimately this may help us to reach our goal, which is to provide superior treatments for our patients and to improve the quality of life of these patients and their families. I would like to thank you for your attention and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you.